during the COVID era, you know, every time I'd be stopped by the police on these movement restrictions, and they'd ask me who I was, and I say I was chairman of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, they always thought that I'm a member of the security industry where maybe I'm in charge of security in Nairobi, but they didn't look at it in terms of... And um, other global um, circumstances have led to uh, the rise of interest rates. I mean, if you look at the U.S. Uh, economy, for example, the U.S. today is sitting on the highest um, uh, debt burden in the history of that country. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see the pressure that was created by the Russia-Ukraine war led to a spike in the cost of uh, fossil fuels and gas that are used to fund, that are used to sort of power um, many of those economies in the West. It is another exciting episode that Kenya explained. My name is Esther Nyonje and I'd like to thank you, our precious viewers, for always staying here with us. And remember we said Kenya Explained is social, economic and political conversations on that matter, conversations on that angle. And today we want to bring it into an economic angle to educate and inform you. I'm joined by one amazing Mr. Kipruno Kitungi. Welcome. Thank you very much, Esther. It's How lovely to be with you this morning. How have you been? I've been very well, thank you. You look so sharp. Asante sana. Now, if I can introduce him, Mr. Kipruna Kitungi is the, um, is the current chairman of the Nairobi Security Exchange. Uh, he's the founder of Af Radio Africa Group Limited. He sits across uh, so many boards. Uh, just to, I, I, can't, I can't mention them all, can I? <laughs> They say he's a man who wears so many hats. How can one person, how can one person go through all that in his daily life and still look sharp as you're looking right now? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. There is a, a Japanese saying that if there's a, a task to be done, look for the busiest person, give it to him. Because the moment you learn to, to develop a routine where you utilize all the days that you've been given and all the hours that you've been given mm -hmm. uh, and learn to effectively delegate and to effectively deal with the things that you have to deal with then it becomes possible yes i do wear many hats i chair several boards um, including co-founding radio africa founding this uh, being one of the uh, primary investors and, and uh, shareholders of mtech limited where we are seated today mm -hmm. um, obviously the role i played in the kenya national chamber of commerce in reviving um, that institution so I guess it's just uh, habitual that I have been able to develop over the years uh, a potential to, to be an incisive business leader mm -hmm. and to provide leadership and governance to, to boards. All right. Yes. You, you turned 60 recently and um, you, were, you were awarded by the Business Monthly as one of the top 25 most influ influential board chairs in Kenya and the region. Must be fulfilling. Um, I must correct that. My brother, Colonel Kiton, turned 60. Uh, I'm still, I'm 58, but he, I will be 60 in two years' time. Oh, it was wasn't the, you? It was my brother. All right. So, uh, yes, I'm also really grateful that I was, for the second year running, uh, nominated amongst the 25 most uh, influential chairmen in the, in the country. All right. Yes. Congratulations for your well-deserved uh, achievement. Thank you. And now... Um, you are the chair of the Nairobi Stock Exchange, and we are bringing this conversation to an economic angle. And for sure, I can tell you, sir, that uh, most of my viewers, they are maybe young people uh, coming to get into the real economic world, or maybe older people who are not in touch with the stock exchange securities, and they view it as an elitist, on an elitist view. So if you could explain to us um, a bit and an elaboration on the Nairobi Security Exchange and its activities. Um, I must say that is a topic that is very dear to my heart. And, um, you know, when I took over as a chair of the exchange in 2020 in the middle of COVID, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I learned very quickly is that there is a big need to, to demystify stock trading. Yes. There's a big need to, to take the conversation down to the common man, uh, to the youth. We need yes. to make uh, investment uh, and... Uh, you know, opportunities to trade in the markets, as exciting as it would be, say, for people who get to take part in gaming. Yes. I think when you saw the numbers of companies like Sport Pesa, the number of punters that they had, I mean, um, those are all people who are captive audiences who could be actively trading mm -hmm. on the market. You know, we are a leading financial market infrastructure um, organization. We are leading exchange in the, in the sub-Saharan Africa. We provide world-class technological uh, capability that provides you know, for investors to, to be able to sell 
their bonds and their shares on the market and also provides a meeting place between buyers and sellers. Um, so in, if we were to describe what the exchange is, it is actually a financial market infrastructure mm -hmm. um, company. So we, our primary products are obviously bonds. Um, and shares. Mm -hmm. At the moment, uh, we've recently the bonds value of the bonds has uh, marginally surpassed that of uh, shares, but the total uh, market cap of the NSE is about 5.3 trillion Kenya shillings, mm -hmm. uh, almost split 50-50 between the two. Mm -hmm. So um, we are a significant market in this, in this part of the world mm -hmm. with about 48 uh, counters, uh, about 15 to 20 very actively trading counters, of course the largest market cap company being Safaricom, followed closely by Equity Bank and KCB and many other counters in plantations, in uh, manufacturing, etc. So we want to really, you know, go to town. In fact, one of you look at our strategic plan. One of the things that we'd like to do is to take the market down to the common man. Yes. We would like the common man to be able to participate. Recently, we did um, a pro an initiative, a reach outreach into the um, low-income residential areas in Nairobi, mm -hmm. and um, and we took we took our products there, and we we just we registered many. Last year we had a big drive together with CDSC Corporation mm -hmm. for people to open CDSC accounts, and later on in this interview I'll be saying why this is the time that we would like people to seriously look at the exchange. Yes. Yes. And what what are the exact steps that you were taking? To you, you've mentioned about taking it to the Nairobi suburbs. What of the people who are far away into the devolved counties? How are they? How can they be involved in opening their CDC accounts and uh, trading in the stock market? You know, the late and revered Nelson Mandela said that a, a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step. First step. Yeah. So we flagged that initiative off. Um, in Upper Hill a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. and it is our plan, especially when um, you know we start with the state-owned enterprise listings that we anticipate will start this year. Mm -hmm. We would want to go to every county to really talk about this, and we'd like to partner with the institutions of higher, higher learning. We'd like to partner with the devolved county governments. We would like to partner with the savings and credit organizations across the country, mm -hmm. so that we can actually go there and create um, an environment where we bridge the knowledge between those who know and those who don't those know. Those who don't know. So we are actually going to go out of our way to make it a simple uh, exercise where we provide civic education to the common man yes. about what it is that is available for them on the stock exchange. So that program has not been there before? It's a pilot program? Um, well, I would say yes, we are uh, the focus. You see, right now we have about, of all the instruments that are on the market, um, about 70% are foreign funds owned by um, you know, the, finance, the fund managers in the West, mm -hmm. in New York, in London, and many of the other leading capitals of the world, and only 30% mm. of the total investable uh, funds in the NSC are local funds. But if you go into you know, the financial uh, sector in this country, there is a lot of money. Banks, insurance companies, pension funds are holding a lot of money. SACOs. Um, I had a meeting last week with one SACO that is almost unheard of, and they have a balance sheet of 23 billion Kenya shillings. So you see, these are organizations that could be actively deploying their funds for the benefit of their stakeholders in the exchange. Mm -hmm. What we just need to do in the exchange is to fix the supply side where we need to get enough products mm -hmm. for them to invest in. All right. Yes. All right. Now, it's the post-COVID era, yes. and uh, it's a change in the economic recovery. With the economic recovery after the COVID era, we've had the longest drought for 40 years, and it has impacted our economy. Now, at this point in time, what are the potential areas for new listings in Kenya? Um, I, I would say we are at, a, at the cusp of a great renaissance in the market in this country. Uh, as you know, we've had the privilege um, of hosting President William Ruto twice at the exchange. Um, first, very soon into his term, he actually came to the exchange and made a, a strong pronouncement that this year the state-owned enterprise would give us 10 uh, new listings. We hosted him again last month when he came to launch the, the RIT. Mm -hmm. the lab, lab trust uh, lab fund uh, writ, writ mm -hmm. and uh, real estate investment trust mm -hmm. and uh, again he pronounced himself and he, he showed great commitment towards the revival of the market mm -hmm. the kenya kwanza administration has shown a great appetite for boosting mm -hmm. performance in our markets only last uh, two weeks ago his excellency the president was in new york mm -hmm. yes and he rang the bell at he the new york stock exchange yeah. and again made a, a very strong pronouncement about what he intends to see mm -hmm. um, similarly leading the charge we have our cs national treasury who is very committed and is leading a committee uh, you know comprising of many stakeholders to look at the viability of state-owned enterprises and creating a pipeline which we shall be working with
-hmm. We have committed to the government that we, as they give us listings through SOEs, we too will be going to the private sector to talk to um, owners of scalable businesses to bring their businesses to market. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say it's an exciting time. We've got, if we get even half of the 10 listings that the president has promised us, the market will be very vibrant. Mm -hmm. So our intention in the short term is to deepen and to broaden the market, to deal with the supply side, mm -hmm. to provide um, funds, uh, equity funds for investment, say in the affordable housing project mm -hmm. that the government has. Mm -hmm. You know, that we can galvanize that. We would like to participate also in the commodities exchange, which is being envisaged. Mm -hmm. Our, the CS uh, trade, Moses Courier, has been a great crusader for the commodities exchange. And we want to work on all these initiatives to see that we have a vibrant market that is the leading market in sub-Saharan Africa. All right. Following only after Johannesburg, um, Cairo, and Lagos. In Africa? Yes. All right. Uh, you talked about uh, the president ringing the bell in the New York Stock Exchange market. What is usually the significance of ringing that bell? Um, you see, the f first and foremost, you know, the president would not be the N NY would not be the New York Stock Exchange without the invitation. You know, that is the leading exchange on earth. Yes. And the very fact that he secured an, an appointment, an invest, uh, invitation, is a sign that the global investing community considers his administration and himself as a significant player in the mobilisation of resources. Uh, through exchanges globally, yes. so the president was there and he did make a very strong he made a very strong statement, mm -hmm. and I felt uh, I mean I was very proud to see the Kenyan flag flying um, at the NYSC, and mm -hmm. uh, you know that made a very strong statement. I don't think we've seen leaders from frontier markets like Kenya mm -hmm. uh, been given that afforded that honor. Mm -hmm. As you know, also the fund managers in the United States, uh, people like BlackRock and the rest, are the ones who hold the largest pool of funds for investment. And the problem with these frontier markets is that the assets that we have, I mean, we in Kenya might think that uh, Safaricom with a valuation of 1.2 trillion is 1.1 trillion before uh, the bear run is a big deal. But for these New York funds, it's really nothing. I mean, it's very small mm -hmm. in the global scheme of things. So we need to create many products. We need to create many counters. Mm -hmm. In Johannesburg, they have about 380 um, listed companies, so they offer a much bigger value proposition. Mm -hmm. So we need to actually deal with the supply side. We need to make the markets a viable option for business owners to take their businesses when they would like to create liquidity events and perhaps um, also deal with succession issues. Mm -hmm. We have very many privately owned companies in this mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. in many sectors of the economy, in manufacturing, in industry, in uh, transport, in agriculture, which can actually meet the criteria. All right. All yeah, right. Yeah. So ringing the bell potentially means that uh, it's a good will from the foreign investors to, it, it's an open market for them to come in, invest in the Kenyan stock exchange market also. Absolutely. And that they're taking us seriously. All right. Yes. Okay. And then um, on to that, uh, you've mentioned something about uh, the cabinet secretary for trade having a, a, a uh, being standing out to support the stock exchange and I want to ask about uh, the relationship between uh, the government, the executive and the security exchange because your position as a chairman is a position that is, it's elected. You're elected by... by the shareholders. The shareholders. Yes. It's not an appointment. No. Yes. No. I, I, I want to make it very clear mm -hmm. that the NSC is not a state corporation. Yes. Now that I is mean, what we want to clear. Uh, many people don't seem to understand that. In fact, uh, Esther, I'll tell you a joke during the COVID uh, time because you know we are referred to as the Nairobi Securities Exchange. Yes. As opposed to the Nairobi Stock, Stock Exchange. Stock Exchange. Yeah. Many other markets also refer to themselves. You know why? We, it was this, it was changed to securities because it now will cover uh, multiple other financial instruments as opposed to just stocks. But during the COVID era, you know, every time I'd be stopped by the police on these movement restrictions, and they'd ask me who I was, and I said I was chairman of the Nairobi Securities Exchange, they always thought 
that I'm a member of the security industry where maybe I'm in charge of security <laughs> in Nairobi, but I didn't look at it in terms of the mm -hmm. financial securities. Mm -hmm. So um, um, the relationship between government and the exchange is paramount. In fact, if you look at many of the leading exchanges in the world, like Euronext in France, um, they are what they are because of the support that they received from the governments in the, in the European Union. They created uh, many of their utility companies, like our water companies here, Nairobi Water, Athi Water, those are very strong utility companies with a very strong cash flow. And it ha there is empirical evidence globally that if you list these sort of companies, it improves governance, it reduces political interference, and they deliver profitability to their shareholders mm -hmm. much more robustly than they would if they were owned by the counties or by governments. Mm. So um, in that respect, I think uh, the relationship is paramount. And again, if you look at countries like uh, you know, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the government of Saudi Arabia, uh, the, the kingdom, the, the rulers, have put a lot of funding into their own exchange. And for that reason, they have performed a lot better than many of the other exchanges in the region. Okay. Yes. Well, it's a pleasure to tap into the well of wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, keep subscribing to this YouTube channel as we continue this conversation. Um, so, with you, in your view, Mr. Kitongi, is it, um, does the government interfere in any way? And what is the advantage or the disadvantage of government, government interference and uh, performance into the security exchange market? Um, I would say that the government regulates. It regulates. Yes, we are regulated by the Capital Markets Authority. Yes. And um, that is a very, uh, it is important that the government regulates because you see we are dealing with and provides the ground rules of engagement. I mean, I would want to mention the name, but there was a company uh, one or two years ago in Nairobi that was able to mobilize from the public up to 13 billion shillings without a CMA license. And it became everyone's question, what happens to the investors who put the money into that fund mm -hmm. and they had no recourse. Mm -hmm. So for us, we are regulated and uh, the government ensures that we have the proper governance structures in place, we have the proper tools and instruments, we are running our business in accordance mm -hmm. with global best practice, mm -hmm. we are safeguarding the investment of those who have confidence in the market. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a few years ago when we saw many banks collapse, Imperial Bank went down with a lot of depositors' money. Nakumat collapsed with a bond that was listed on the market. And you see, for that reason, it is important for government to monitor mm. the activities of the exchange. Mm -hmm. yes. And I say that uh, investors have uh, in recent past kept off the bonds floated by the Treasury. Is that a vote of no confidence to the government of Kenya? I don't think so. I think it was just an adjustment uh, between, um, you know, you know the, the issue of the scarcity of dollars created a little bit of nervousness among the investing community. And, um, you know, when I delved deeper into the matter, um, to my surprise, actually, we do not have a dollar shortage. What we have is um, people, exporters, and those who are earning their income in dollars, holding their dollars. I was actually made to understand reliably that in Kenya now, we have about up to one trillion Kenya shillings in US dollars. The unfortunate thing is that it's not in the hands um, of the government or in the hands um, of the banks per se. It is in the hands of those who export. Oh, yes. For example, I'm a coffee exporter and I receive my income in dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm under no obligation to sell those dollars back. So what happened is uh, a very robust secondary market was created you know, where there was a big difference between the uh, allowable central bank exchange rate for dollars and the secondary market that had created itself mm -hmm. with a huge almost 12, 13, 14 shilling difference. So the president again stepped in and remedied that, and we are hoping to see a more stable um, foreign exchange. That's the current president. Yes, mm -hmm. we are waiting to see a more stable foreign exchange regime, mm -hmm. where dollars would be easily accessible to, to traders. Mm -hmm. If a fund in New York or a fund in London or in Tokyo or in Timbuktu, for that matter, came and bought shares in Safaricom, they would like that at the point at which they sell these shares, that they can get their money in the shortest time possible. Mm -hmm. But what is, when the dollars are not openly available to, or readily available to them, mm -hmm. then it creates that uncertainty. All right, all and right. then um, again, I, I made to understand from the fund managers that uh, there was a sort of a speculative wait to see if the pressure by the government to redeem its liabilities would see an increment in the interest rates. So at that time, I think the interest rate was in the region of 13.72. But then there was uh, some speculative wait and see. Yeah, but I do believe that uh, the money market is going to 
go back to its normal um, oversubscription. Uh, this issue of uh, this issue of uh, hoarding dollars is it a current issue or is it something that has been faced with the uh, previous regimes? Um, I would say that it has been faced in the past, but right now more than before. More than before. Yeah, because if you look at the geopolitical environment, uh, the war in the Ukraine and um, other global um, circumstances have led to uh, the rise of interest rates. I mean, if you look at the U.S. Uh, economy, for example, the U.S. today is sitting on the highest um, uh, debt burden in the history of that country. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see the pressure that was created by the Russia-Ukraine war led to a spike in the cost of uh, fossil fuels and gas that are used to fund, that are used to sort of power um, many of those economies in the West. So that, that, econ that macroeconomic disruption in the West also had a knock-on effect on us. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the debt that Kenya has taken in the years, I mean, the, the debt we owe to China, mm -hmm. the euro bond, mm -hmm. they're all hard currency denominated. Mm -hmm. So when there's pressure on our soft currency against those hard currency, it means then that the debt obligation is increased. Yes. So that is a challenge that we've been having. I believe it's a short-term challenge. Um, I'm, I'm very um, enthused by the choice of the president of the stewards of the national treasury. Um, Professor Njuguna and uh, Dr. Chris Kipto are both very, very well respected and very well reputed. You have, you have confidence in them? I do indeed. Uh, well, there's, there's the, you mentioned the euro bond and Kenya's big, big ticket debt obligations, including the 200 billion euro bond, is coming to bear within a few months. And that will no, in no doubt cause a strain mm. on the already limited resources, as you have said. Now, how is this going to, okay, you've already mentioned how it's going to impact on the foreign exchange market. Mm -hmm. There's something I want uh, to pick your mind on in um, Kenyan's relationship with the Bretton Woods institutions. Yeah, okay, let me start with the bond uh, issue. Um, first and foremost, if we do a peer review, um, you know, Kenya's debt is not as alarming as some political operators would like us to believe. Is it not alarming? It is not alarming, and to the, not, to the extent that, you know, apart from those geopolitical circumstances that I had talked to you earlier, it is not that we are tottering on the verge of bankruptcy. Yeah, I like to believe that this administration needs to be given a chance to reorganize itself. Um, the next Eurobond redemption in 2024 is not a long way away from now, but I do believe that the government will have an option of refinancing it with longer term funding. Yeah, the government will have an option to, to float a new uh, Eurobond. And um, I do believe also that the, that the package that Kenya will receive from the sustainability fund of the IMF will be also, also be able to help it to redeem some of this pressure in the shorter term. After the 2024 bond, there will be a redemption again in 2028. So if that one can be dealt with next year, then we have another four-year four window mm -hmm. um, before that can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I know that there are many initiatives that are underway. Um, there's the possibility of a diaspora bond. Uh, you know, the diaspora community in Kenya is one of the most vibrant and they do send a lot of liquidity back home. So if there's a diaspora bond, that will again create a pool of funds that can be used to mitigate some of these uh, short-term pressures that we are facing. Mm -hmm. So in all in all, I, I, I all in all, I still remain confident that with the right focus, uh, that this government will actually have the ability to, to turn around the economic fortunes that we are facing. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the biggest concern that I have is uh, the matter of unemployment. I mean, there's so many people going into unemployment for very many reasons. And, um, you know, I think it's very important for leaders in politics, leaders in, in, in the economy, leaders in, in the clergy, mm -hmm. the bureaucracy, everybody. And, and I've been advocating this on national TV very often. Mm -hmm. We need to sit down and figure out a solution to provide gainful employment for the millions of Kenyans out there. Yes. You see, right now, um, I see the, the shrinking middle class. When people fall off employment and companies are laying off people, it creates a great social uh, uh, dynamic that is not positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now on the issue of unemployment and now there is the finance the finance bill, twenty three twenty four. Yeah. What do you think? What impact would, would it have on our economy? Um, very honest with you, I'm still reviewing the finance bill. There's mm -hmm. a lot of uh, proposals in there that I think will be shot down. Um, there's a lot of interesting other proposals like the reduction of. Uh, rental tax income from 10% to 7.5%. Mm -hmm. So it's a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. But I think um, more than anything else, um, we need to, what I see lacking in the, in the financial planning, of, in the policy 
planning of government, especially with the, with the focus on enhancing revenue collection through taxation, is a lack of a commercial assessment of what those proposals do to business. Commercial assessment? Yes, you see, like, uh, for example, if you look at the proposals they have for the gaming industry, I mean, the gaming industry has been used in many other jurisdictions to raise money to develop sporting. Mm -hmm. But if you look at those proposals, they're actually, the government just saying close all the gaming companies, which they will close and they'll go. But then again, you lose out on that tax. So, it, it, you know, you're thinking that you're going to raise the tax, but in reality, you're closing that industry. Mm -hmm. If you look mm -hmm. at uh, the multipli multiplicity of taxation between national government and county governments, mm -hmm. In hospitality, for example, again, we have 17 compliances in hospitality. So, mm -hmm. you see, it becomes very difficult. If you're running a hotel in Kakamega, for example, you need to comply to 17 different authorities, both at national and county governments. County government. So, and you, all of these require mm -hmm. a payout. Yeah. So, you see, when you factor these into the bottom line of, the, of those businesses, mm -hmm. then it becomes almost an unviable undertaking. Right. So, I think for me, um, I, there needs to be some thought given to what these tax proposals do to commercial enterprise on the ground. Okay. Yes. All right. Talk to us about uh, cross-listing. And there's also uh, some ESC countries, that is uh, Uganda, Tanzania, and Rwanda, signed an agreement to electric electronically link their stock markets. And uh, Kenya pulled out of the electrically linking deal. Uh, due to some issues with the Pakistan ICT department. Should Kenya be joining these electronic, electronically linked stocks? Okay, first and foremost, let me uh, inform you that the, um, the Secretariat of the Africa Securities Exchange Association sits in the NSC Nairobi. And already there is a linkage of all exchanges. We flagged it off um, in, um, in uh, Morocco. So, um, two months ago, and um, this will link all markets across the continent of Africa. That secretariat sits here mm -hmm. in Nairobi under the purview of uh, Mr. Jeff Odundo, who is our CEO. So we are part of a greater initiative to link the markets across Africa. The reason why we never participated in the East African one is because we had concerns about the technological platform. You know, Kenya, our exchange is actually the leading one in terms of its own technological adeptness. Mm -hmm. And our technical team looked at that uh, solution and did not feel confident that it was the one that was going to deliver a stable enough platform. So we were, it's not that we are not joining, but we are waiting for the concerns that we raised to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But more significantly, I am of the view that you know many of the markets that we have in africa are not big enough are not deep enough are not broad enough mm. i mean some of our neighboring countries and i shan't mention names have up to three or four active trading counters and um, one of the conversations i would want to have with our leadership here is perhaps we as kenya as the largest economy with the biggest market should be leading the charge to get the exchanges um, merged into one east african exchange that has that provides the depth and the breadth um, for us. I mean, I think that patriotic um, concern that everybody wants to have their own exchange, I think we need to look past it and have an East African exchange yeah. that works within the ambit of a, glo of a larger African exchange. Yeah, because we're also looking forward to having a common currency. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Now, you were chairman of the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce and Industries when the African Continental Trade Area Agreement was signed mm -hmm. in 2018. And if I can uh, mention the figures, the intra-Africa trade stands at 14.4% of Africa's GDP compared to Europe's 69% and Asia's 59%, with only 2.9% of global production. So what does the future portend for the continent? And how do you see the immediate policies or actions government can take to improve this? Mm -hmm. um, it's a very good question. And it's a conversation that I have pronounced, it's a topic that I've pronounced myself on many times. In fact, in two weeks' time, in, uh, on the 24th, I'll be addressing FESTAC in Arusha on this specific topic. You said FESTAC? FESTAC, the Festival for Africa okay. Relations. And um, in June, on the 8th of June, I'll be addressing the chambers of Southern Africa in, in Victoria Falls. And again, that's a topic that I've been asked to, to address. You see, um, I'm sure you've noted 
that it's such a big deal that India is the largest population on Earth. They have overtaken China. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, the question about whether a, a large population is a boon or a bane has actually been proven many times. A large pro population provides a huge uh, consumer base and provides, you know, a strong bedrock for the for industry and for agriculture and for many many things. So Africa has the fastest growing population on earth and by the year 2050 we shall be the largest population more than India. So focus will shift automatically to Africa because it's the next big market. We have the youngest population on earth, we have huge untapped mineral resources, we have an infrastructure that has hardly been developed. You know African infrastructure was actually designed by our colonial masters not to allow for us to trade with each other. Would you believe it, Esther, that 50 plus years after independence, we don't have a single vessel plying Lagos to Mombasa. So if you've got to export things from Mombasa to Lagos, it's got to go through Oman or somewhere. It's got to go through wow. Dubai. Mm -hmm. There's no vessel that, that provides that direct link. Mm -hmm. So for me, I completely believe mm -hmm. that the AFCFTA provides a way for Africa to to re-engineer re its own economy, mm -hmm. to be able to trade with each other. 14.4% mm -hmm. is, is a tip of the iceberg. Yes, um, it is. I, one of the things uh, that I did habitually as a chair of the Chamber of Commerce is in every country that I visited, I went to their supermarkets just to see what bouquet of goods and services are available to their local populations. And just by a cursory um, observation, you can tell um, the industrial capability and the ability by those nations to feed themselves. Surprisingly, a country like Zimbabwe has gone through a lot of sanctions. They, if you go to the shelves of their supermarkets, most mm -hmm. of the stuff are made in Zimbabwe. Now, if you go to Nigeria, for example, Nigeria is the largest exporter of oil in Africa. But then they import practically almost everything. So Nigeria today imports its butter and dairy products from Australia and New Zealand. We have a dairy products surplus in Kenya. So what is so difficult for this to happen? Our former President Kenyatta, um, with good luck, Jonathan, President of Nigeria, had started a conversation to have a special status agreement that will be able to live, that will be able to look beyond the bureaucratic uh, obstacles that have been placed by the EAC in, Ken in, in this region mm -hmm. and echo us in the West African region to allow us to trade directly with each other. Mm -hmm. So we can export our dairy products which we have in surplus, and they can export their oil products to us. Mm -hmm. But that never saw the light of day because of the obstacles that are provided. Okay. Yeah, so there's, it's sometimes, uh, I, I would say this is a no-brainer. But we've allowed bureaucracy to stand in the way of Africa, trading with Africa. Mm -hmm. And now what is the standing of, um, of the Africa continental trade area? How, what, what are you doing to improve that sector, where, uh, the key sectors, okay. to lead to its changes and improvements? One of the things that I'm doing, and actually I am in the process of preparing a presentation for Mr. Wamkele, the Secretary General, whom I was in contact with a few days ago, we would like to see if they can bring um, the initiatives of the AFCFTA closer to business. I'm proposing that they appoint trade champions in each of the countries. That will be a, a combination, a, a trade champion secretariat, that will be a combination of private sector and public sector players to really work on removing the shackles that delay the implementation. You see, the presidents of Africa sat down in Kigali and they signed the protocol. Yeah, but now it goes to the bureaucrats to implement. Yes. When the bureaucrats implement, they mm -hmm. pass on the new proposals to the private sector. Mm -hmm. But sadly, I mean, if you go to the Arusha, sorry, sorry, if you go to Namanga, you will find that you know, by and large, many of the NTBs that were there a few years ago still prevail. Mm -hmm. So we are not allowing for the free movement of goods, services and human capital. Mm -hmm. There are some countries in Africa that have done a commendable thing. And I want to talk about the government of Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. What Ethiopia did is they said, look, for a short, for a limited period, I think it's six months, mm -hmm. any African flying into Ethiopia does not need a visa. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah, so mm -hmm. long as you're not going to seek employment mm -hmm. and you're not going to be there longer than a certain period of time. That's a show of confidence. Obviously, there will be people who try and abuse those sort of privileges, mm -hmm. but then they did have a confidence to believe that Africans should be allowed to travel in Africa. Yes. I mean, I have been to 83 countries of the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ratio of African countries I've been to vis-a-vis -vis European 
or Asian or even Latin American countries probably not as it should be. Mm. Well, Africa itself has 52 countries. Yeah, but then if I was to ask you, Esther, you yourself, how many countries are you into in Africa? One. You see? <laughs> and you, and uh, you see, you could make it to, where, which one have you been to? Uh, where? Which country have you been to? Uh, Tanzania. Tanzania? Yeah. If you took, uh, from your home in, in Western province, it'll take you 20 minutes, one hour to Busia, yeah. Malaba, yeah. or Busia. Mm. You'll be in the second country. Mm. It'll take you three hours to Kampala. But we don't venture and visit and see what it is that our continent offers. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Now, uh, today, Mr. Chair, today the country has been hit with, uh, with an increase in fuel prices yeah. because of the removal of the subsidies. Mm -hmm. And you, you are a large scale farmer, and I know this affects you in one way, or it, it affects you holistically, not in one way or another. Yeah. So you are a business person, you're an economy expert, you are also a large scale farmer. What was your thoughts on the removal of subsidies? and also the introduction of GMOs. Uh -huh. um, you see, the subsidies in and of itself were not sustainable. Uh, because on the one hand, um, it was providing relief to the consumer. Yes. But on the other hand, it was providing Some a pressure. debt burden to government. Yeah. So it is almost akin to digging one hole to cover another. Because when you dig one hole to cover another, what happens? You still leave a hole to be, to be, to be covered, isn't it? So I think um, the fossil fuel prices, um, you know, are something that the government should be able to stabilize once our macroeconomic debt profile has been addressed. Yeah, when the government has enough resources. In the short term, I think this is a consequence of geopolitical pressure, not about by the Ukrainian war, the knock-on effect it has had on the hard currency. Mm -hmm. I mean, this time last year, the dollar was at 120. Today, it's trading at 136.50. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, quite a significant, uh, almost 15% um, devaluation of our shilling, mm -hmm. which has a straight away uh, impact on the cost of petroleum. So unfortunately, for the, in terms of uh, fuel, is that it has um, a direct effect on inflation baseline inflation and already as I told you many Kenyans have lost their jobs people at the bottom of the pyramid are literally at a point where they cannot survive mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and so um, there's also about the GMO the genetically mod modified organisms yeah um, GMO I think for me is something that is a it's a scientific conversation um, in principle I, I don't have an objection to GMO unless it is demonstrable that it is uh, has a negative, um, but negative effect on human health, and I think that has not been demonstrated. I mean, in America, people are you need GMO for years. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, the, the topic has been politicized. GMO can be used um, to to mitigate, uh, you know, the low productivity that is. Uh, as a result of rain-fed agriculture. You can mm -hmm. see today, this is now we're in the middle of the rainy season, mm -hmm. but we are hardly seeing any rainfall. So rain-fed agriculture is becoming a less uh, viable pro proposition. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it is a conversation that is scientific. We need our scientists to interrogate some of the more harmful effects and bring the facts to the fore. Mm -hmm. I think many times the conversation is held by laymen who don't have a big understanding of it. Mm, you're a farmer and yourself. Do yes, you use the GMOs? Do you use the genetically modified organisms? No, I, I don't. But what I'm trying to do now is to try and use as much uh, of the natural f uh, additives. You know, there's a big drive now f to go, um, you know, to use, you know, the more natural. And if you look at, for example, the coffee farmers in Colombia, they're producing five times the amount of coffee per tree that we are and they're not using the fertilizer that we're using here. So I'm, I'm for the idea that as a country that is predominantly agricultural based, we need to start to see how we can get more scientific intervention into our agriculture mm -hmm. and how we can also use our water bodies mm -hmm. to ensure the highest productivity. Mm -hmm. I don't think as a country We've been serious about agriculture at all. We have not been serious about agriculture. Not at all. Not even the introduction of the subsidized fertilizers. Have, have you got the subsidized you see, fertilizers? Those are, those are, I would put them as, tac I, I did of course, but then I would say these are tactics more than, than strategy. We need an overall master plan 
in terms of how we can use the available agricultural resources we have to maximize productivity. Kenya's geographical location makes it the ideal country for supply, not just to, to the East African region, but to the continent at large. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Thank you for your time, Mr. Kitongi. And uh, apart from your busy schedule, uh, traveling to countries in the board meetings here yeah. and there, uh, making trade agreements and what, what do you do for your free time? What's your favorite spot? Um, I, I go to the gym. Um, regularly, almost daily. I do every day of the week. And, uh, I play golf, but I, I love farming, so I go to the farm quite a lot. All right. Yeah. Uh, your favorite sport you say is golf. I do golf. Okay. I, I jog, mm -hmm. and I and I gym. All right. What yeah. book are you currently reading? What book? What book are you currently reading? Um, right now, I'm reading the Jewish phenomena. The seven reasons why the Jews are the most successful community in the world. Oh, I haven't heard of that before. Yes. Well, thank you for creating time out of your busy schedule to educate our viewers. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time, keep subscribing, like, share, and comment. Goodbye.